Welcome to The Debrief. This episode is the second episode in our season look back over the summer where we're going back and looking at season one. Um, this episode is with Mike Hillman. Uh, Mike is a legend in the tactical community, was one of the original 60 members of LAPD D Platoon, also known as LAPD SWAT. Uh, Mike was one of the founders and developers of the National Tactical Officers Association, and, uh, and fortunately for me, one of my personal mentors and heroes. Mike and I had a, a ranging interview that actually consisted of two episodes. This is the first of those two episodes, talking about the evolution of special tactics, um, the creation of LAPD SWAT, um, where the tactics came from, the events that drove the evolution of special tactics. And the thing with Mike is, to this day, Mike is still teaching and is still kind of a, a tactical oracle for a lot of us to turn to uh, to get information. So I would encourage you to watch this one and then go back and watch episode two with Mike. But I hope you enjoy my conversation with Chief Mike Hellman. My name is John Becker. For the past four decades, I've dedicated my life to protecting tactical operators. During this time, I've worked with many of the world's top law enforcement and military units. As a result, I've had the privilege of working with the amazing leaders who take teams into the world's most dangerous situations. The goal of this podcast is to share their stories in hopes of making us all better leaders, better thinkers, and better people. Welcome to The Debrief. This is the first in a two-part series with Mike Hillman. Mike is a legend in the tactical community with a list of career accomplishments that would take a podcast of their own. But as a brief bio, Mike was one of the original founders of LAPD SWAT, a deputy chief at LAPD, the assistant sheriff in Orange County, California, and an assistant chief of police for the Los Angeles Port Police. He was one of the founders of the National Tactical Officers Association and is a nationally recognized expert on leadership, crisis management, critical incident management, special operations, and a wide variety of other subjects. For this first episode, we're going to look back at the history and origins of SWAT, talk about how it has evolved over time, the founding of the National Tactical Officers Association, and look at the current challenges being faced by SWAT teams. For the second episode, we will explore Mike's views on leadership, critical incident management, tactical decision-making, and the role of SWAT in the modern tactical environment. Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate you being here. John, thank you very much. And if I can go back, there are no experts in this business of SWAT. We're all students of the problem. Any day that we stop and we uh, start rewarding ourselves because we've got all the answers, we're headed for uh, disaster. It's a fair point. Why don't we, to start, let's, let's go back to the beginning of your career and kind of walk through, you know, it's, it's your career started at a critical time in the evolution of SWAT and you were present for a lot of the events that, that gave rise to this. So I would love to just kind of walk through the history and, and parallel that to your career, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So where does it start? Well, you know, the 60s were a very tumultuous time, as they are now, of course. I mean, history repeats itself. But in, the, uh, in 1963, I, after I got out of high school, I went into the Army and then got out of the Army, and I went into the Los Angeles Police Department in 1966 on my birthday. And it was something that I had wanted to do for some time. I was very impressed with the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, in 1966, we had just finished up with the first 1965 Watts riots. And because I grew up in Los Angeles, I had a chance to see how the Los Angeles Police Department performed, and I was very impressed with it. I had a very strong interest in tactics uh, coming out of the Army. I, I was very interested in what... Uh, LAPD had to offer. And, you know, when I got out of the academy, uh, I found myself, like every other recruit, uh, you know, doing the various things that a young police officer would do to be able to help learn their career. And when uh, Rampart opened, we opened Rampart and I went to patrol and then ultimately went to traffic enforcement division. And that was probably right about the 1969 time frame when I had a chance to to really get exposed to what the Black Panther Party 
was involved in. And again, there were ambushes of police officers that were taking place. <laughs> Unfortunately, not much has changed since then. But at the time, it was something that was a very high priority for all of us in, in law enforcement. And then, uh, you know, along came the opportunity to be able to go to what was described then as a full-time special weapons and tactics team. It wasn't a platoon then, but there were other um, uh, four plank holders and forefathers that were involved in the part-time team. And in 1970, when I was ultimately selected into Metro, we started with a full-time special weapons and tactics platoon that uh, ultimately started off with a little less than 60 people. And I was fortunate enough to be a team leader at that particular time. So you were a P3 at that point? I was P3? a P3 plus one, plus which, one. Was, which was an enhanced position of the patrol officer position, and it was in a leadership role. And you came in literally as the platoon became a full-time element was when you arrived. You were selected into that first group. I came in as a P3, which uh, with when I came into Metro, then uh, ultimately the platoon had started under Bob Smithson. And uh, I was promoted to a three plus one, which put me in charge of, at that time we called them, you know, an element, which was a five person element and two elements constituted a squad of 12 people with a supervisor. Got it, so that's 1971. Yes, it is. And then 72, kind of begins the modern terrorism age with the Munich massacre and the beginning of, of evolution of, you know, hostage taking as a, as a you know, methodology of business for terrorists. In, yes, internationally, I mean, the Munich Olympics were obviously a benchmark and there was a lot of lessons learned out of that. We had transportation of hostages, we had buses involved, we had uh, multiple locations that were involved and now we call them complex coordinated type of attacks. But at that particular time, that was something that was relatively new. And, the, and I describe the 70s, at least in my career, as kind of in dealing with SWAT as pretty much the benchmark of some of the things that we started to do in terms of SWAT. We relied very heavily on the United States Marine Corps to be able to have us be able to come familiar with sophisticated firearms training and sophisticated firearms training was basically pistol craft and the use of rifles as well as movement. Uh, building entry was something that was left to us. The Marines were not too much into that at that particular time. But what we saw is in the 70s, in the early 70s, we had in Los Angeles, we had a Gosh, uh, Mike Edwards, who was a police officer, was kidnapped and killed. He worked 77th Division. Uh, we had, uh, uh, at the time, uh, just after the SLA shooting in May of 74, we ended up experiencing a helicopter crash that killed one of our commanders because we were learning how to be able to shoot out of the helicopter. And that was a piece of tactical technology that we were looking at because we were dealing with the aftermath of... Um, uh, the Hanafi Muslim incident, which took place in Washington, D.C., which represented a high-rise type of capability. you got to remember that going back to August of 1966, uh, we had the, um, uh, the Charles Whitman incident that took place in, in Texas uh, Tower, in, in, Texas Tower in, in Austin. And so we were concerned about how we, we, how we were going to deal with that type of situation. So, I mean, there was a lot of things that had taken place. Marcus, Marcus, excuse me, Marcus Foster, who was a school board superintendent up in uh, Oakland, had been kidnapped and killed by the SLA. And one of the, one of the key factors in that whole period of time is because we'd finished up with the Black Panther Party in 69, and we started to see ambushes of police officers were becoming much more prevalent. The SLA had planned a kid, a, uh, an ambush situation up in Concord. There had been shootings up there where they were taking vans and basically putting automatic weapons in the back of a van and, and basically baiting in law enforcement to try to, uh, to kill them. There was a lot of this type of activity. So what we were doing in SWAT at the time was trying to develop tactics amongst ourselves that would bring us up to a state of where we could be able to counter those types of things. We spent a lot of time training, um, and, and this goes to the issue of uh, the reputation of SWAT, a lot of time training uh, recruits when they came into the department 
when they would go through their last portion of their training at Universal Studios. Huh. And one of the uh, one of the pieces that really helped us in SWAT was to be able to build a rapport with the department. SWAT was new. Yeah, for SWAT sure. SWAT was new in, in even you know you can go back to sixty six, sixty seven, and you know it was relatively. Um, an anomaly at that time. In That's 70s, revolutionary. I mean, it's the, it's the one of a kind at that point. Well, it was. And in 70, and during the 70 period of time, we had to spend time internally in developing our own department into understanding what SWAT was in terms of a life-saving organization. So the 70s were really a benchmark. We were starting to learn a lot about what we needed to do and where we needed to go. Was most of the mission set initially kind of counter ambush, um, you know, counter, for lack of a better term, insurgency, uh, you know, more focused on that kind of Black Panther weather underground? Like, how do we, how do we counter ambush? And, and, and that was the initial mission set. When did that begin to change? Was it Munich or was it after that that it, you began to kind of broaden the... The spoke, well, the scope. Munich certainly changed the, the paradigm a little bit, but but to your point, at that time, counterinsurgency wasn't a term that we used. Counter ambush was what we were dealing with. And we were still dealing with the aftermath of, of uh, uh, the Black Panther Party. And one of the issues that we had to deal with is that we had information and intelligence that the Black Panthers were using storm drains uh, to be able to navigate in the underground within the city huh. and so that they could be able to move um, you know, unobserved and to be able to uh, deposit their weapons and that type of thing in that facility. So we spent a lot of time uh, in the uh, in the storm drains, believe it or not, wow. which, uh, you know, today's hazmat environment would obviously not uh, bode well. Sure. But then when we got to the to the Munich Olympics, then we started to look at the different dynamics of what the terrorists had used. So that 70s period uh, was, you know, obviously we were dealing with the anti-Vietnam issues, we were dealing with counter-ambush, we were dealing with protests, but for the most part, SWAT was focused on counter-ambush and also starting to deal with moving into the counter-terrorism field, and that wasn't until the 80s. Interesting. So, um, during this period, if my memory serves me correctly from previous conversations, this is kind of when the CNT concept begins to develop for LAPD also, right? Well, that was, it was very interesting. The dog day afternoon that, uh, that came out with uh, NYPD, it was 1960, 1976, excuse me, that uh, there was an opportunity to go back and take a look at what New York Police Department had been doing in terms of what was a completely new concept, hostage negotiations. And the concept of hostage negotiations in New York Police Department was that, uh, that two individuals, uh, Dr. Harvey Schlossberg and Frank Bowles, who uh, both had, both were NYPD personnel, but they had behavioral science degrees and they were psychologists that started to look at being able to use communications to be able to help people uh, that were in crisis, not only hostages, but also um, to affect the safe release of, uh, of a hostage and or surrender of a suspect. We had the Stockholm incident that started to develop and oh, yeah. so that the Stockholm syndrome was part of that. So we in LA, we're still looking at the methodologies that we're using for you know what we would call a contain and call out type of, of, of environment to deal with SWAT. And one of the, the issues that became very apparent is that you know we use time, talk, and tear gas were the three primary issues that we so used. Three Gs. But, but at that time, that was what we had to deal with. And we thought, well, you know what? There could be something here that we ought to take a look at. And so that, that LAPD did not want to become insular. We wanted to reach out. And so um, I was fortunate to get a chance to go back to New York. And I took a look at essentially what uh, Harvey and, and Frank were doing. And I thought, this is an incredible opportunity. But here's the difference. NYPD had uh, the, the ability to be able to draw from detectives and to create a negotiation component out of detectives while their emergency services division would be the tactical operators. And so that they would respond to an incident that involved a hostage situation to where they would take their negotiators and put them in the first place and then bring in the tactical component 
and then that there would be, you know, what we would call now an incident commander, or now at that time was probably a tactical commander, would uh, probably start to listen to what the negotiators would say in terms of what their progress would be. And the issue that I saw when I was back there is that the negotiators would always want to say, just give me a little more time, where it, at some particular point, windows of opportunity to be able to rescue a hostage are not always there. And so that negotiators can go past windows of opportunity and miss an opportunity to be able to engage in the number one priority. And that's life-saving, get those hostages out. So what the issue was is that they would you know, then get into an intervention mode. Intervention would be the last piece that they would use. And there was always a disconnect. There was competition between negotiators and between tacticians. Sure. And so when we had a chance to come back, and at that time, uh, Lieutenant Pat McKinley was the, uh, the platoon commander, I explained to him that I said, you know, we might want to consider taking this negotiation concept and apply it to all barricaded suspect situations where we can communicate with individuals, time talk, and to be able to get them to hopefully convince them to release the hostage or to come out. But we do not want to have a situation where we have to draw from other resources within the organization because we have the talent pool here within SWAT and D platoon to be able to train our operators, and we would call them now, in a position to where we can train them as primary and secondary negotiators. But that's not all of it. We need to bring in a psychologist. And we had a huge behavioral science department within LAPD. And um, we ended up taking uh, psychologists and we explained to them, this is what we want to be able to do is train our personnel in communication to deal with you know, individuals under stress, um, psychologically deranged individuals, terrorists, uh, you name it, the traditional type of criminals, and to be able to give them communication skills to be able to overcome that type of action and to be able to coordinate negotiations and tactics. So the idea was that verbal and physical tactics needed to be together. Yeah, fusing the two so, as opposed to having them as separate disciplines. Precisely. And so we brought them into D platoon. Now, since then, I mean, things have evolved. Uh, Mike Albanese has done a tremendous job in being able to carry on where some of us left off. But the the issues we had, you know, bilingual individuals now, we have investigators within, or detectives within uh, D platoon now that, that build that component. But uh, the, the negotiation piece was a huge shift in that 70 period. Yeah, I mean, that was, at the time, not only is SWAT as a concept revolutionary, but this whole, you know, like you go back to Munich and kind of negotiation, and it wasn't, it kind of wasn't a thing, right? Like, it's, it, it's whoever ended up with the microphone was the guy that was having to negotiate, and it wasn't a discipline the way it was as you guys developed it. it, it, it absolutely. It, you're, you're right on the money, and it you just sparked, sparked a, uh, a comment that it was a huge shift to paradigm. Uh, it was not well received initially within LAPD because it was like, well, wait a minute, we're, we're digressing from what our operations are. And it, I became very adamant about it and so did Pat McKinley. I said, we're special weapons and tactics, verbal tactics and physical tactics. And the priority is to save the lives of the hostages and to avoid confrontation when we can. It's interesting though, it's, that's kind of a, it, that's a very advanced concept for that place and time. Like now that's, we, you know, it's de rigueur that negotiation occurs and you know, that the two kind of fuse and you're looking for windows. But at that time, I mean, that was a very different view of, of criminal behavior and the need for intervention. And so I can see where there's probably some like, what do you mean you're gonna negotiate? Like, what do, why are you gonna talk to the guy? Well, and that, you, <laughs> there was a lot of controversy over that. There became the East Coast and the West Coast concept. And I always said that verbal and physical tactics need to go together. And I said, we will use verbal tactics to help reduce the potential threat to the hostages, gain the release of the hostages, and also the surrender of the suspect. But there may come a time where we have to use negotiations to manipulate subjects into a position where they can be neutralized to save the lives of the hostages. And we've done that. 
it is like that there is that crossover between the two. And, and there is a point where like there are some people you will not negotiate out, right? You know, the kind of the modern Islamist terrorist, you're not going to negotiate them out. They're there to die. And so at that point, that communication becomes a, a means through which you can effectively rescue the hostages, even if that requires an intervention, it facilitates the intervention. Well, it, it, there's so many tactics that can come out of, of the negotiation process. And it starts off with the intelligence. And I mean, you look at the most recent um, incident that took place in Coleyville, uh, Texas, to where the Jewish synagogue was taken over, and yet they had a landline's phone where the suspect in this particular case was positioned and was communicating and basically had a camera in a position to where they could see him. And so that there was a tremendous amount of intelligence that came out of that in a, in a negotiation process. If you can use negotiations, which has been done, to be able to gather that intelligence so that tactically plans can be made to be able to intervene, that's the best case scenario. And not to move into the 80s, but when we got into the 80s, that's where we started to develop the tactical operations center concept, to where we started taking you know, the negotiators and starting to bring in intel using the snipers, the Sierra positions, to be able to gather intel for the operators to be able to handle an extremist type of, of, of emergency assault if necessary. So it's interesting because so even early on, you guys were looking this as as a fused concept with with an overarching mission, not to tactically intervene, right? I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of what you just said is it was not just let's tactically intervene. The objective is to rescue the hostages, and there may be ten paths to doing that. Intervention well, may be one of them. The, the objective were to have the suspect release the hostages. And when you talk about the delivery of food, when you talk about the delivery of vehicles, um, what we started to see here is, you know, going back to Munich and going after, going back to one of the incidents that I can recall specifically the Time Motel, to where we had to plan on how would you deliver a vehicle if the individual demanded a vehicle for escape? Well the decision is we're not going to allow a suspect to go mobile, but we may have to manipulate them from a stronghold into a position to where they come outside so that if we have to intervene, we can. But we need to be able to disable a vehicle, and we need to be able to handle vehicle assaults. And I'm kind of moving ahead out of the 70s. Yeah. But when we get into the 80s, the, the technology that started to develop on how we were going to deal with immobilizing a bus was very interesting. But before we got to that, then we started to, to develop tactics on vehicle assault processes. And that was huge coming out of the late 70s and going into the 80s. It's interesting because I, I guess the next, you know, like if you, if you look at the, the history of SWAT, there's certain signposts on that road. Uh, Munich, obviously, you know, SLA being one, Munich being in kind of the, the period that follows Munich, um, the hostage taking period. And then we kind of get to the 84 summer games, right, in L.A., and that, that is a, a significant moment. Talk to me about the, the buildup to the Olympics and the effect that that had on you guys. It was about 1979. It was just, just before the 80 period. And the Iranian embassy had been taken over in Tehran, the American embassy. <clears throat> and there was a lot of interest in that particular incident as to how the United States was going to deal with that. And I remember getting a phone call uh, because of some of the relationships that, that I had with some of the uh, U.S. Army Special Operations Groups, which at that time were not considered that, but they were considered something less than special operations. And they were inter we were introduced to several people that uh, came out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Colonel Charlie Beckwith and Blue Light. And because of the relationship that LAPD had with uh, the Sheriff's Department and the fact that we wanted to be able to start thinking about combining our resources of the Special Enforcement Bureau and LAPD because we got along very well, to be able to create a much larger tactical component, 
we got invited back to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and kind of to kind of a you show me your stuff, I'll show you my stuff. Show and, and tell. the first relationship started to develop about that time, and it was just a short period of time that we spent with him. And just for context, Colonel Beckwith is the regarded as the founder of the First Special Forces Detachment, or DELTA. Right, and at the time, uh, the SEAL Team 6, or DEV group, as it's known now, uh, was starting to spool up as well. So then along came Desert One, which was uh, in the 80s, right in uh, that period of time, and the debacle that occurred in the uh, in Desert One. Which is the, the failed attempt to rescue the Iranian hostages. And where it killed a couple of Americans and ultimately ended up leaving a... Uh, helicopter and a C-130 over in the, uh, the, uh, the middle of the Iranian desert. And it was a, it was a terrible situation, uh, and it was really kind of an upcoming for, at that time, Delta Force. So it was after that time, probably in 81, where I spent quite a bit of my time, um, I was a lieutenant, um, or might have been still a sergeant, I can't remember exactly what it was, either a sergeant or lieutenant, but uh, Daryl Gates had uh, said, whatever we need to, need to do to keep America free and to work with those particular individuals we're gonna do. So I found myself down at Fort Bragg, spending quite a bit of time with uh, Delta Force who were in the process of recuperating from the de debacle that occurred in the desert. And there was a lot of, at that time, a lot of tactics and technology that started to come out of that period. Now, you got to remember that uh, we had the incident that occurred at Princess Gate that involved the SAS. 2-2 two -two SAS. Uh, there was the incident that occurred uh, with the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization out in the middle of the desert that took over the airliners. Uh, there was the guy. Uh, there was Tebby. There was there was a Baron Switzerland. Not not only in Tebby, but yeah. there was GSG nine. A lot of these special yeah, operations sure. groups had started to develop about that particular time, and they were sharing tactics and technology with Delta at that time. And so we ended up, an LAPD, being able to spend quite a bit of time in in picking their brains. And I, uh, to be honest with you, I came back with a mound of information to where I said, okay, now we've got negotiations, we've got tactics, let's bring it together with a tactical operations center. And it was like, well, what's that gonna include? Well, that means that we take Sierra positions, or at that time we called them snipers, and use them to in gather intel and to verify or refute information that was coming in from negotiations so that we had the connection between the two. The negotiators say, he's on the phone now, the snipers might be able to see that, snipers might be able to see where the hostages are. We could start developing that type of, of relationship, coordinating it within the tactical operations center. And I could see at the time it was gonna require additional personnel, additional supervisors, because we had negotiation, crisis negotiation team supervisors that were trained and we had SWAT supervisors that were trained. They were cross-trained in each other's responsibilities. Huh. So that on a particular call up, you'd have a SWAT supervisor that was in charge of dealing with overall tactics. You would have the crisis negotiation, another SWAT supervisor that might have crisis negotiation team training that would take their primary secondary negotiator, the psychologist and a journalist and start being able to develop it an exchange of information along with a sniper coordinator. So you had all kinds of components that were coming together and the sophistication of what we were doing in the 80s became, at that time, cutting edge. We started to learn things that, that uh, we'd seen in the Army, what was known at that time was hostage rescue and we called it crisis entry. And you know, we, it, the involvement of crisis entry uh, was something that as we started to shift in paradigm and we got more experience up into the more modern area, it's changed since then now with limited penetration. But at the time, it was cutting edge type of, of uh, actions. And then we started thinking about going back to a, um, the Munich time frame. What about taking Sierra positions and having simultaneous snipers shoot at the same subject at the same time? Oh, that was new. And that was called coordinated target selection. Huh. And then based upon what we learned after the SLA shooting in the 80s, 
we needed to establish an exterior perimeter with around a particular target site that would prevent suspects from escaping and would prevent them from moving about. So we created what we would, at that time, we call the support line tactics concept, which came out of Ron McCarthy's head, which ultimately involved a sniper position that was an overwatch, and then we had contact teams that if we had movement in a particular area while an incident was going on, we would move the contact team to be able to interdict it. So all that was coming out of that, that 80s time frame. Now, <clears throat> you know, some of the things that we were dealing with in the 80s time frame was, you know, the development of um, sound and flash diversionary devices, which we really started to, to see uh, develop. Uh, commercially, it became something. And I could give you a side note about one of the experiences that I had while I was down at uh, Fort Bragg on that particular issue. Yeah, I would love to hear that. During the 80s, there was a, this, I'm going to start off with probably 1981 to about 1984, because these were the times, this was the period of time where we're leading up to the Olympics. And this was what I call a watershed moment for uh, LAPD at the time, as well as LA County Sheriff's, because <clears throat> we had to start developing much more in terms of our skill set to be able to deal with the potential of what we were looking back on 19, uh, with the Munich uh, Olympic debacle that took place, where they had transportation of hostages and the buses and aviation and the snipers had missed and all kinds of other dynamics and lessons learned out of there to prepare for what was going to happen in, in potentially with 1984. So I found myself down at Fort Bragg and I found myself working with just absolutely the most incredibly brilliant individuals and tacticians that anyone could ever have. I mean, it just was just so impressive. But it was interesting. Um, going back to the GSG-9 hostage rescue incident, uh, a organization or a commercial manufacturer known as Shermley out of uh, the UK had developed a sound and flash diversionary device that they had used to stun, they were called stun grenades then, they were used to stun the, the suspects and the terrorists at that time so that the rescuing force would get on the airplane. Money out, cutting it short. So now I find myself at Fort Bragg and the Army is going to develop and build their own uh, diversionary type of devices. So I was invited into a room by one of the Army engineers, EOD techs, and he said, okay, so now we're going to show you how to build flashbangs. I said, oh, this is going to be good because I can take that back to LAPD. So we started off taking in the table, there was a variety of different tools. There was an M116A1 um, a uh, hand grenade simulator, which had a pull striker on it. The friction, made out of, the friction fuse. Made out of cardboard. Yeah. And then there was a, a M201A1 second and a half Bouchon type of fuse yep. that was sitting there. And there was a hot glue gun and there was a small little three eighths inch drill bit. And so I'm what looking at- What could go wrong? So I'm just looking at these items and there's five or six other uh, individuals who are sitting there. There's a guy from SAS that's sitting there and I'm here and two or three other army guys. He says, now, very carefully, you want to tap this upside down to get the cardboard and the powder, which is aluminum powder, down in the bottom. It's very sensitive. It's flash powder, which as soon as he said flash powder, I immediately went, this is dangerous. Yeah, oh, yeah. And the next thing, he says, you're going to take this three-inch drill and you're going to very carefully, key, key word, carefully. Yeah. Don't make a spark. Don't cause any static. Push and drill a small hole in the cardboard. Oh, God. To which I find myself doing, and everybody else is doing. But everybody's kind of looking at everybody else like, <laughs> is this really happening? So finally we do that. Next you take the, the 201A1 fuse, you put it inside the cardboard, and take the hot glue gun and hot glue around it. And hence, you have a flashbang. So in, in one of two ways, you either get a flashbang or you get a flash and a bang. <laughs> so I had all my fingers. You got the flashbang. And when we came back, I ended up talking to Arlie McCree, rest his soul, who at that time was our bomb tech, and he said, you did what? And I said, this is what we did. But eventually we had them build us flashbangs that were made just exactly like that. And that was the, the precursor to the commercially made ones. Now there was all kinds of problems with it because they would frag and 
the uh, the Bouchon would cause injury, things of this yeah, nature. Yeah, they would launch the, the Bouchon U secondary projectile. <laughs> but that particular piece of it was something that we took and prepared for for the 84 Summer Olympics. So the next thing that we came up with was how are we going to disable a bus if a bus is demanded a la uh, yeah. Munich? So the FBI hostage rescue team had started to develop in 1981. And they basically went through the same maturations and processes that we did in terms of learning and bringing in various expertise. And one of the individuals that uh, I found very insightful is a, an HRT operator that was a bomb tech by the name of Jamie Atherton. And so Jamie Atherton from FBI came out here and worked with uh, Arlie McCree and Ron Ball in developing a technique on dealing with buses. And so we ordered up for the period of uh, the Olympics, well in advance of it, three crown coach school buses. Now, Crown Coach was an old style school bus. Diesel, back window came up, drum brakes, etc. So that the technique that we came up with is that we were going to disable the vehicle if we had to and still create where we could use speed, surprise, and diversion to be able to get on a bus some type of charge that would prevent the vehicle from moving and essentially stop it. So we took not we, but uh, the bomb techs took about 400 grains of dead cord, put it around the inside of the drum brakes, and basically serrated the castle nuts for the front hubs so that you could take that and tie it into the back with the window and put dead cord around the back window to be able to uh, create a shooting port in the back window, and then command detonate that with a remote device. And I had the privilege of watching that and watching the front wheels come off of a crown coat, crown. Literally, the wheels coming off the bus. A crown coach type of bus uh, is very impressive because that bus immediately will stop. Now, Mike Albanese, who was a sergeant at the time, did a tremendous job of being able to take the side of that bus and replace all of the safety glass with tempered glass so that you could hit the glass and it would clear out. So that now what we were practicing was a bus assault. So the bus assault, if we could get individuals that would come out in the open, if we were not able to take you know, a coordinated target selection piece of it, they would get onto a bus or get on one of these buses, we could essentially be able to stop that bus or prevent it from leaving by blowing the front wheels off. And then it would be approached from the back with essentially assault force complex or component and a, a assault force that would come up on the side with ladders that were cut down so that they would have shooting ports and at the same time have a rescue component in the front of the bus. Well, that's what we did, you know, prior to 84. Well then, <clears throat> because we had basic access to the United States military, to HRT, to a lot of other resources, DARPA, who was the Defense, Defense Advanced Research Agency, came out with a concept that they called surrogate travel. And at that time, I had transferred as a lieutenant to anti-terrorist division to develop the intelligence component to support SWAT within the Tactical Operation Center. And so I had access to this surrogate travel piece. Well, in 1983, there was probably close to 500 Department of Defense personnel that came out and took thousands of photographs of UCLA, USC, and all of the venues. And they would take photographs of the building from the ground, from afar, to each door, to the locking mechanism, to the windows, so that today, when you go on a virtual tour of a house, you go on that virtual tour of that house where it all consists and run without any particular interruption at all. Well, this surrogate travel piece came in a, in a pretty substantial sized containers. There were two or three different TV sets where you would have one monitor that would show you the overview of the location you'd be tied into a joystick 
along with another piece over here that would have a about the size of a 33 and a third record, which I just dated myself, that would be on a, a large CD or a DVD. Yeah, it's like a, the old... Uh, 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 record. Yeah, they were like a video disc. They, well, it was a large video disc, yeah, yeah. but it was about the size of a 33 and a third record. And you would take that and you would be able to manipulate that and you could basically look at a door, you could look at the hinges, you would look at the, how the door opens, you would see it open, you could walk inside. It would be essentially what we have today is the modern day version. Well, that was state of the art then. So that's, that's Google Maps. Oh, it was it, virtual home tour. Correct. In 1981. Before well, probably, anybody is even thinking, I mean, it, it's it's it started to develop in '81 and became a reality in '83 because we were using it. But it, it's just it's it's crazy to think like you said several things there that that you kind of just passed over as part of the story. But like you're talking about the birth of flashbangs in law enforcement. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, the Arlie McCree being, if not the the foremost law enforcement bomb expert in the in the country, certainly one of them. Uh, you know, the, the foundations of the Langford versus Gates suit, which is the seminal decision on the use of flashbangs. Well, we didn't even discuss that one. Yeah. I mean, and, and then pre-scouting locations, pre-practicing tactics. I mean, this is so much of what is today regarded as modern and like this is just what we do. You guys were doing literally for the first time. Well, we at that time... It, 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 this was all cutting edge. Oh, yeah. And, you know, going back to the Hanafi Muslim incident uh, that took place in Washington, D.C., where we had two high-rise buildings that were taken over at the top levels by the Hanafi Muslim at two different locations. We were trying to figure out how we were going to be able to, you know, essentially put assault com or components on each one of the buildings to be able to rescue hostages because they were separated. And so that they were separated across an alley. And so there was training that we uh, basically engaged in where we put ladders across an alley that was probably close to five, 600 feet off the ground where we had operators that would have to carry explosive charges across to another building. And we were at that time Looking at, you know, we had a, uh, we, it wasn't even a UH-1. It was a smaller uh, helicopter that we were looking at to where we started to uh, engage in fast roping and using that technique to be able to insert personnel or extract them off the top of a building. We went back to the Vietnam era and used spy rigs to start training our people. If we had to put them on a building and we had to get them off, we could put them in spy rigs and pull them off the building. So all of that was, was state of the art. And some of the technology that we started to garner from the military um, is 45 caliber suppressed weapons hmm. to where you could use that to take out street lights or engage in being able to have a sniper that wouldn't compromise an entry because you couldn't hear it uh, to be able to take out some sort of a, of a terrorist that would be a sentry guarding a compound. So, so the all, beginning of suppressed weapons in law enforcement. It, it, and so all of this was, you know, at the time, this was all state of the art. What I think is really interesting here is that, like all of these things, suppressed weapons, aerial insertion, climbing cadres, and extraction, bangs, and aerial extraction, aerial extractions, things that are today regarded as de rigueur, you had to solve for the 84 summer games between you and the sheriff's department you had to have a solution for every nightmare you guys could come up with. And in the process, you know, like literally triggered things that happened in the industries. Flashbangs as an industry develop largely because of those initial, you know, forays. They did. And they, uh, it was, it was quite a process with the development of flashbangs. I mean, Sid Heal did a tremendous job of writing the the doctrine on how to be able to deal with, you know, flash and sound diversionary devices. But in that 80s time frame, uh, John Coleman, who retired uh, from the Sheriff's Department and was in SCB, the Special Enforcement Bureau, he basically started the National Tactical Officers Association, and that was about an 82. And his vision at the time was to bring tactical operators from all over the United States together 
to share experiences because no one particular entity had all the answers. And it's very interesting in this business, in law enforcement, you can become very insular and you need to be looking outward and being able to be much more collaborative and either collaborate or you die, you know, one, you know, it's, it, you, you have to be able to see what other people are doing and maybe you take the best from what they have and what didn't work so well and be able to combine it. So the eighties were really a, a watershed moment and it wasn't, you know, after probably the 84 Olympics, when uh, I started to promote up through the ranks, that I finally came back to develop our Special Operations Bureau to where I was able to really have now influence over our aviation component, our special weapons and tactics component, and be able to help merge them together. So today, we have a very close working relationship with our aviation and, and SWAT components and our canines. I mean, you look at canines, the process in the 80s, we started to move canines into a D platoon. It wasn't until later on that they became less than an anomaly to where canines were used to, a search, to assist in searches. Uh, the use of breaching, explosive breaching. Um, we had an opportunity to go to work in an off-duty capacity to help train uh, the special response teams in, uh, for the Department of Energy. The, those are the groups that provide the security for the various nuclear sites. And tremendous technology came out of that. We were able to come up with the first two armored vehicles, V-100s that were provided to LAPD. In the 80s, we had, that, we had the rock houses that we were dealing with. And we were using uh, extraordinary means to be able to get into the rock houses. Extraordinary means means that we were using either bar poles or we were taking and penetrating the location with a V-100 that had a long uh, pole on it that ultimately uh, uh, was used to be able to take apart a house. That, that's, I think, is, is another one of those moments that kind of inflected the entire industry, right? Because prior to that, you know, everybody was using, you know, the old bread trucks and like, you know, the, the SWAT TV show, you know, where they had the bread truck. Um, and the V-100, as far as I know, is one of, if, if not the earliest deployment of armor by a special tactics team. It's certainly one of um, the earliest deployments. And, and t tell me a little bit about kind of the environment of the, you know, the war on drugs and this, this fortification, you know, the idea behind fortifying houses so you could get rid of the evidence and kind of the tactics that evolve from there. Well, let, let me go back, John, for just a second and touch on a couple of things. You know, everything we've talked about now uh, has not come about without the risk of failure. Sure. And, and the, the risk of failure means that there are some things that we learned the hard way. You mentioned the Langford V. Gates when we first started with use of flashbangs. Well, unfortunately, uh, there was a flashbang that was used that ultimately caused the demise of a female on a high-risk warrant service. Dolores Langford. And so the, the evolution of all of this, uh, going back to, it was a week after the Sibonese Liberation Army incident at 54th and Compton, where uh, we were pushing shooting out of a helicopter because of what happened with Texas Tower and so forth. And we ultimately ended up killing a, a, a commander out of it because we were operating without the the expertise of what we were starting to develop on our own that later came about from the United States military. Mm -hmm. And so that some of this demilitarization nonsense that's come out has been something where I totally disagree with it because the technology, the tactics, and the ability for us to save lives of individuals is a result of our relationship with the United States military. 100%. And what's interesting is throughout my career, you know, since I, I started Aardvark in 1987, and, and so I've, I've kind of been a witness to a lot of this evolution and fortunately have known a lot of you guys for a long time. It's, there's this notion that all of a sudden the military said, oh, hey, here's tactics. And that, that has not been the case. It has been this give and take between the military and law enforcement. Like I can remember when, when we first became involved with, with DOD was for United Shield in Somalia. And the way I got involved was the Sheriff's Department pulled me in to meet with the Marine Corps. The conversation started with what is non-lethal? You know, how do we do riot control? 
and and so it's it's you had the exact opposite. You had the U.S. military going into these environments, whether it was Somalia or later into Afghanistan, where they had a multi-threat environment. It was not what the what DOD was built for, and they had to figure out tactics. And frequently, the way they figured out tactics was they embedded with law enforcement and said, "Show us how this happens." You know, you're absolutely right. You just spurred another thought. This is when Jeff Rogers and I were working together. He was my lieutenant and I was a sergeant working for him. That, you know, originally we started off with, we went to the United States Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton to have them help us with, you know, education and um, what we call now IEDs and things of this nature and, uh, you know, pistol craft and rifle and, and shooting skills. And later on, the Special Operations Training Group out of the United States Marine Corps came to LAPD and said, hey, we're going to go into an extremist environment and have to start doing house-to-house -house type of searches. Show us how to do entries. And so we started off with, with entries, and we started off working with them. But going back to this 80s time frame, one of the, I mentioned that, you know, it was not without some errors that took place along the way. One of the things that came out of the 80s is that we worked very closely in developing this crisis entry or hostage rescue tactics where we'd flood a location with personnel using speed, surprise, and diversion. That unfortunately took off and became the norm for a while. So that when we started getting into this rock house business that you mentioned to where we started seeing you know, the, the destruction of of evidence and, and narcotics and things of this nature, that using speed, surprise, and diversion in a crisis entry was something that, that was being used not only by us, but by a lot of different agencies because it became the norm after yeah, the Yeah, dynamic Olympics. entry was how you just, that was just how you and, did it. And, and it, 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 at that time, we still called it crisis entry, but it became dynamic entry. And as a result of that, a lot of people got hurt and we started to re-examine the fact that, wait a minute, why are we having to do this and putting ourselves at risk when we're going after narcotics, when there's other ways of doing it to be less confrontational? So is, I think that probably Lee McMillan probably had a chance to describe the limited penetration concept that started to redevelop some of that crisis entry. And now we have you know, the, the contain and call out and we have the breach and delay and limited penetration skills that we started to develop now. But in the 80s, uh, this was something where we really started to pick up on that. The use of TEMS, tactical emergency medicine, uh, the NTOA was starting to bring all of these skill sets together. We were doing a lot of aviation insertion extraction work with light observation style helicopters and so forth. And it became, uh, it became quite, a, uh, quite an industry. So talk to me a little bit about the early NTOA. Uh, John Coleman founds it, and then, you know, from, from my recollection, you know, shortly after there, uh, I think of NTOA, I think of John Coleman, you, and Ron McCarthy as kind of the, at least from here, as kind of the prime movers. Who was there initially, um, and, and who kind of built, you know, built it up to what it was? John Coleman and Janice Coleman, husband and wife, yeah. built that whole organization. Ron and I and Jeff Rogers and you, because you were involved in bringing a lot of the, the technology together, were very instrumental in being able to help the NTOA get off the ground. And we started that particular process. Uh, you know, my role was to provide the training and the curriculum for the yearly five days and to be able to get the, the venue. And I mean, we had to rely on a variety of different venues. We used San Diego, we used Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, we used, I'm trying to think where else that we used, but primarily in the early days, those were the two entities that were willing to support us. And it was interesting because in the early days, I, I go back to San Diego, if it were not for decision makers at the highest level supporting the NTOA, I do not know where we would be today. I agree, yeah. Because, and I, I left out Florida. We went to Hollywood, Florida mm, yeah. on one occasion. But in San Diego, uh, San Diego Sheriff's Department provided us all the aircraft and the facilities and provided all their personnel. In, um, 
in Albuquerque, a private vendor provided us with an aircraft. DOE provided us with a venue. Uh, in Hollywood, Florida, they did the same thing. And a lot of these, a lot of these agencies had administrators and decision makers and chiefs and sheriffs who were putting their careers at risk. And San Bernardino County Sheriff, they gave us a helicopter and a pilot to be able to support the training. Nowhere else in the law enforcement community could any of this taken place without the support of all of that. And John Coleman made all of that happen. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember very early in my career, um, NTOA became the catalyst through which everybody grew. Like I, I can remember if you advertised in NTOA's magazine, you got the page your ad was on, you never got the magazine. And, and I, I don't know whether I was the first civilian member of NTOA, but I, I definitely was early. And, and I can remember every issue reading cover to cover and it was debriefs and it was tactics and it was, it was the channel through which the community shared information and you could watch the entire community elevate through, through the magazine, through the conference, through you know, LAPD, LA sheriffs going out and doing training. And it, you know, it, it, that was, for me, that was the point where it kind of caught fire it, it, nationwide. It, it did. And the, the whole focus of what we were trying to bring together was this collaboration, number one. But the true skill set of a good tactician is not fighting the last war or fighting the last incident, but looking forward. Now, you have to look at some of the, the successes and lessons learned from what happened before. And building a, what I would recall, what I would call a, a, a tactical considerations file to where you as an experienced operator can go back to, in my case, I can go back to the 60s and I can pull up everything from the FBI Florida incident to the, to the GSG-9 operation, to any of the major incidents, Princess Gate, any of the incidents that we happen in LA, I can pull up pieces from it. And if I see similarities, I'm able to say, okay, now this is what is an anomaly. This is what's a similarity. This is what worked well. This is what didn't. And I mean, those kind of, that, that kind of experience level is what John Coleman was trying to inculcate into the community by having debriefs so that, you know, you may not agree with everything that was done, but by the same token, you didn't have to agree with it. This is what happened. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, like debriefs have always been a thing in the military to look back at, at an event and, and evaluate tactics, evaluate what happened and try to learn as many lessons as you could. What I think changed with the NTOA was the concept that you weren't only looking at your own debriefs, you were looking at everybody else's. And, and I don't know when John saw it, and he may have seen it from the beginning, but this idea that you know a, a tactical commander, a tactical operator is using paradigms to make decisions. Correct. Right? And those paradigms, you don't have to live through that event to be able to utilize that paradigm. Right? That's like basic, you know, somewhere in the past, millions of years ago, some guy found a rattlesnake and tried to pick it up and got bit. And everybody since then has said, yeah, don't pick up a rattlesnake. But that's correct. You know, we, we, that's we, a good analogy. We don't, but you know, not everybody had to go get bit. And, and I think that, that one of the things that the NTOA did, especially early on, was, you know, it was like, hey, Mike found a rattlesnake. Mike picked it up. It bit him. Don't pick up rattlesnakes. And that was the thing that, that I really loved early on is the, the depth of debriefs. And honestly, that, that was the genesis for our tactical lecture series was as a kid and growing up through the industry, going to debrief after debrief after debrief with our teams and realizing as you walked away, like, oh, I, I know not to pick up rattlesnakes. And then you have all those paradigms. You have that Rolodex that now you look at it and you're like, ah, it, it's not a rattlesnake, but it's snake shaped. <laughs> Well, you know, and it, that, that's, that's really a good point, and it goes to the issue of what makes a good SWAT operator. And in thinking back when I was brought into, you know, SWAT, it was, uh, you have an interest? Yes, I do. Can you uh, run, do pull-ups and push-ups? Yeah, I can. Can you shoot? Yeah, I can do that too. Can you think? I can do that. Now, today, as a result of the 80s, 
Jeff Rogers uh, had taken the selection process from Delta, from SEALs, and from HRT. We sent we sent officers back to the hostage rescue team to participate in their selection standards. And today we have got the best operators that any agency could ever have. And the, the state of preparedness of these individuals where they don't pick up rattlesnakes and they learn very quickly and they're looking ahead, they're forward leaning, they look around corners. When I say look around corners, I'm, I'm talking about thinking ahead and coming up with new dynamics and tactics. The state of the people that we have today is phenomenal. And it's because of the selection process. You get what you select. And I'm sure that some others that you may interview will talk about the selection process for, for deep platoon within LAPD. And it's very, very stringent. And it's been highly contested uh, as a result of it. But today it's produced the best individuals you could ever have. When I was a deputy chief there, and I had those individuals under my command, I never worried about anything or any decision that they were going to make. But a lot of that evolved from all this work that was done early on. I, I think that's a good place for us to, to stop our first conversation and lay a foundation for our second conversation. Mike, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Well, thank you, John, for at least you putting forth the effort to be able to share some of the experiences. We really appreciate it. My pleasure.